Hi everyone, and I'm really excited to be talking to you today about a topic that I think doesn't get much attention, but it's super interesting when we dig into it, and that's the psychology of skincare. So I'm Eleanor Chapman, and I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I work as a mental health lecturer and researcher in the UK at the University of East Anglia and the University of Cambridge. And I'm very privileged to work closely with dermatologist colleagues um, in my psychology clinic I run at Self London, which is in um, Harley Street, Central London. And also very proud to be an ambassador for the charity, the British Skin Foundation. I have my own uh, lived experience of um, chronic skin conditions, and I'm really passionate about supporting them in the work they do to raise awareness of the impact of living with a skin condition. Um, speaking today, of course, in a personal capacity. So, goodness, there's so much we could talk about today, and I don't have much time. So, I wanted to focus on giving you an overview, a bit of a whistle stop tour, if you will, about the many aspects of psychological aspects of skincare. So we're going to touch on the link between the skin and the mind. We're going to talk about stress, think a little bit about stigma um, and some other hot topics in our uh, skincare content online. I'm going to touch on nutrition and then think about relationship with skincare, which I think um, is an interesting one. And I have more to say about that, but we'll get to that one. So firstly, I think traditionally what's happened is that we've seen the skin as something that's cosmetic and that any concerns relating to the skin are somehow less serious than internal <laughs> medical problems. Um, and separate industries and professions have, you know, arisen around these different domains. But increasingly now, there's recognition that the health, the functioning, the appearance of our skin are intricately linked with our mind, our mental well-being, our mental health, um, and actually separating them is, is a bit of, is a false distinction. And this is reflected in the huge um, rise in popularity of psychodermatology. So that's a multidisciplinary um, area of study in clinical practice where dermatologists work closely with psychiatrists, psychologists like myself and other mental health practitioners to think about supporting a patient um, whole well-being. And it's something that I think the beauty industry and skincare companies are slowly picking up on, if I may say. I think I'm gonna talk about stress next. I think they're beginning to pick up on that, but they're miss missing a bit of a trick. They're, they're not re getting the full picture. So engaging with this idea now and doing some reading about it, you're gonna be really ahead of the curve because I think this is where the field is gonna be going. So. If you take away one idea today, I'm keen to emphasize that the link between the skin and the mind, it's complicated. I am a psychologist, so I'm always gonna say it's complicated, um, but we don't know yet all of the mechanisms and, and, and the directionality, the causal factors. Um, it's not straightforward, but what I can say is that they are intricately interconnected and that this is not a linear relationship. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit now and I'm gonna show you that this is actually a bi-directional relationship. So let's start first then by thinking about stress. So I think for some people, this is really quite um, surprising. You know, the, the, the idea that through, you know, the power of the mind, we can, you know, change our skin, it can change our skin. But if you speak to anybody with um, an inflammatory skin condition, who maybe has noticed, oh, actually, I had a really bad flare up of my, say, acne, during a time of intense stress or intense illness. Um, so stress is a trigger. 
Um, some of us just don't quite realize it. And, and I think we don't yet fully understand the full biomechanics of it, but the, re the research is pointing towards this kind of cycle, which is of course grossly oversimplified, um, but hopefully helpful. So what we know is that psychological stress in itself can trigger the release of stress hormones, which will then lead to an inflammatory response in the skin. So we're thinking of, we're talking about changes in the skin barrier. So that could lead to dryness, itchiness, scaliness, increase in sebum, acne, but also delays in wound healing and even inhibited hair growth. So then it can lead to hair loss. So all of these changes in the skin can lead to a flare up of a skin condition. And if you are prone to an inflammatory skin condition, like psoriasis, rosacea, acne, eczema, then you're more likely to, to experience that, that exacerbation um, of your skin problems. And having a flare up, it's, it's really distressing. It's really difficult. It's painful. It's upsetting. It may look unpleasant. It may be sore. It may make you feel self-conscious. Um, you might suddenly have to think of all the products and creams and cleansing processes you have to go through. You might have to go organize a whole bunch of appointments. It could be expensive and that's burdensome. So having a skin flare up can be for many people highly burdensome highly disabling, especially when it becomes chronic, when it happens recurringly over time. So as this diagram shows, the flare up can then in itself trigger further stress, can trigger, um, and then on top of that stress, um, you know, an impact on mental health. So, and then you can see that it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle that we can get trapped in. Now I talked about it being a bi-directional relationship, okay, between the skin and the mind. And as I've started to, to say there, that having skin problems can have a dramatic impact on our mental well-being. But I, I don't want to just talk about mental well-being. I want to emphasize that, you know, it can have an impact on all forms of our well-being. And in a in a way, I don't want to just pick on one aspect because we're people, you know, we, we live, there's so many aspects of our lives and, and what matters to us and our sense of self-worth and importance and, and belonging. Um, I can't go through all of these in so much detail, but just to give you a flavor of, you know, emotional well-being. So that's the kind of distress I was talking about, lack of confidence, self-esteem. Now, for some people, what we know from the research literature is that having a chronic skin problem can tip them over into mental health disorder. Now, again, the relationship is difficult. It's it's hard to unpick the causality, but certainly people with um, chronic skin conditions are more likely to develop problems such as major depressive disorder, even suicidal ideation. Um, anxiety disorders, um, particularly um, appearance anxiety um, and social anxiety, generalized anxiety, that's worry. Um, also people can develop problems around eating disorders, um, obs um, obsessive compulsive disorder um, and chronic uh, low self-esteem. So it can impact people in so many different ways. Um, that's really important to understand but also we're social beings and it can impact our social lives, our friendships, our work life, school life for kids, um, dating, intimacy, sex life, um, our sense of community belonging. And again, research shows that people with skin conditions are more likely to be lonely and isolated, um, partly because of the stigma associated with skin problems, which I'm going to come on to, um, and fear of judgment of, of others. And people will uh, drop out of physical activity, especially group sports, going to the gym. Um, and as a result of 
the impact across the board, um, people's quality of life can be significantly lower and it can be associated with quite a high degree of disability. Now, a message I'm really keen to emphasize is that we really must never make assumptions about how someone feels about their skin based on looking at them. Now, my understanding is that um, it's quite hard to objectively rate somebody's skin. Even dermatologists, apparently they do disagree about this. And there was an interesting study, or well, there are several studies that have looked at this, where they've asked a dermatologist to objectively, as far as I can, rate the severity of somebody's skin problems. And then they've talked to the patient. And what they found is that there's no equation, okay? Because what really matters is how the individual perceives their skin. You know, the associations they've built up about their skin, the meanings, um, how it impacts their day-to-day -day life, how it makes them feel. It's about meaning. That's what I want to emphasize. And meaning can come from so many different sources, you know, our own personal histories, you know, family influence of family members, perhaps being bullied, uh, personality factors, but we don't live in a bubble. And skin is a social object because it's so visible. And we absorb these cultural and social norms and messages about skin. Um, and that leads to this very rich, nuanced, multifaceted meaning that's going to vary, you know, between each individual. So we must never assume that's why it's so important that we ask people. And talking then about these complex, you know, associations, I wanted to share a quote. Now, this isn't from a patient, actually, it's from somebody who posted a comment on one of my Instagram posts. Um, and I think I was talking about stigma can't remember but they said they'd had a real revelation and I remember they said if only I'd come to this realization when I was a teenager she said I finally realized that having bad skin doesn't make me a bad person and actually that being distressed about my skin it's never been about me being weak or vain and I think this is such a powerful quote for me because it speaks to the way there's all this moraliz moralization about skin, this idea of bad, bad skin, it, it's not socially acceptable, it, it's abnormal, it's not wanted. Um, all these messages, okay, that we've built up about skin that's blemished or has uneven pigmentation or uneven texture as associated often with skin conditions. Um, and that by implication, having that skin makes you a bad person. It, it, it is therefore reflecting you as a person. And that that being so damaging, especially when it goes hand in hand with messages that actively invalidate and undermine how you feel about your skin. Okay, it's almost like gaslight you, that, that you, you are stigmatized, you are blamed. And then on the other hand, you're told, well, this is just vanity, this is just cosmetic, you must be weak because you can't deal with this. And certainly I have heard patients tell me very similar stories, sadly. So we need to talk about stigma, right? Um, this is very real social stigma, um, especially for people with visible skin conditions. And it can manifest in many forms. Sometimes it's more obvious, it's, you know, the bully at school. Uh, sometimes it's the thoughtless work colleague who has just made another unsolicited comment about your skin. Um, it can be more subtle, it can be in the form of indirect social messages. It can be in the form of dis discrimination against people who may look different. Um, and it can be in the form of an absence, right? A lack of representation in the beauty industry, in beauty campaigns, in the media of people who do have visible skin problems. And for me as a psychologist, I'm keen to emphasize 
this in itself is, is toxic, but why is it toxic? Because what happens to stigma is that we internalize it. And when we internalize it, we turn it into shame. And then what we see is, especially if this is chronic, so if it's happening over time, and especially if it perhaps happens during the vulnerable adolescent years when we're developing our sense of identity and our self-confidence, that we become, we come to form beliefs that there must be something wrong with me. I'm bad, I'm dirty, I'm unlovable. I'm not worthy. And that's then when shame tips over into low self-esteem and then we can get depression and other mental health problems. And something else that I think is an important theme that again, I don't see being talked about is this issue of control. That again, all these social messages we get, especially on social media, often give us the indirect or even direct message that you have control over your appearance, over your skin. Just do these things, buy these products, eat this diet, have these supplements, do the, you can get the skin you want, you know. Now, it's not that straightforward. Now, I'm not saying that you have no control, but it's about trying to figure out, do you have as much control as you're led to believe? Because the problem is that if you are pushed into thinking that you have more control, this way lies anxiety. Because you start thinking, well, if only I, I, I could just do more, just this and this and this product or this, maybe this one thing is gonna do it. Now, when you have a chronic skin condition in particular, these may be recurring. And for some conditions, there is no cure, despite the messages you get on social media. So you're trying to cure something that you're, you're chasing a goal that may not be realistic. So control can become a problem. And I wanted, that leads me to talk briefly about nutrition. Everybody seems to be a nutritional expert on social media. And this idea of kind of eating your way to better skin has really been exploited by wellness influencers. I'm not going to hold back here. What I know from my colleagues who are registered dietitians is that, look, this is a complex science. We don't fully understand the link between nutrition and skin problems. Um, and certainly it's been grossly oversimplified by a number of people who often have something to sell. Uh, and the amount of misinformation online is absolutely baffling. Um, even as professionals, I find it hard to navigate and let alone, you know, especially, you know, younger people who don't have that knowledge to critically appraise this material. And for me as a psychologist, this is concerning because when you get messages like cut out whole food groups, okay, this is what leads to restriction and restriction when it, uh, you know, when, when people start kind of crushing all like dairy, gluten, this, this, and I've seen this in my patients because one thing isn't enough, they'll keep cutting more and more and more out because they're so desperate to find what they believe is the root cause. They can't find it. Um, and guess what? They've, they've developed disordered eating. And in some people, what we've seen in our clinic is that they can develop an eating disorder, um, which can sometimes be called orthorexia, which is an obsession with eating pure foods. So it's really important we take this seriously. And just briefly, I wanted to touch on relationship with skincare, because again, I think it's been pushed a little bit as self-care, as in there's no kind of downside. Now, other colleagues will talk about the physical risks of overusing skincare in terms of damaging your skin barrier. But what about psychological risks? What I have seen does concern me with a certain subgroup who have developed overly rigid routines. They're very inflexible and, and obsessive. And I, I mean, I'm not gonna kind of pathologize normal, you know, we all like a bit of skin. I'm sure, especially people on this call, have got skincare coverage. Look, we all love skincare. But I think what can happen is it can tip over into an unhealthy relationship 
where it becomes a means of control. I'm going to come back to that idea again, especially if perhaps someone is quite anxious. Um, there's something about skincare that really can um, hook them in, I think. And I think some people think, well, what's the downside? You know, what's the worst that can happen? They're just spending money. But I think what can happen, what for me is that we could be missing signs of what could be mental health problems. So behind the obsessive, highly rigid um, routine that perhaps someone can't even flex if they're traveling, um, they're taking excessive amounts of time, they're having to check in the mirror, um, and they have this sense of nothing's good enough, I must do more, it's not perfect, it's not just right. That may be the sign that they've really struggling with their mental health. It might be a sign of undiagnosed OCD, eating disorders, anxiety. So I think we just need to be a bit cautious um, how we th how we think about um, using and abusing skincare. And I'm just aware I talked a bit too long, but I just wanted to share some of my thoughts on some of the more toxic traits I've seen in in marketing in the industry. Um, I've talked about some of these already. I'm going to pick up on progression. I think that became a buzzword. It's replaced perfection. It's not without its problems. Because I would argue, well, you can't progress your skin forever. There comes a point where you, re you plateau. So again, this idea of constantly improving, progressing, are we setting impossible goals? And also, crucially, do people know when to stop? without doing further damage. Um, skincare is self-care. Maybe we'll pick up on this in the Q&A. That's very much up for debate, I think, whether that's been a positive influence or not. So um, I'm going to wrap up there and I'm going to leave you with three takeaways, if I may. That our use of skincare as consumers is surprisingly complex um, health and consumer behaviour and it has many psychological and social elements that I think aren't well acknowledged. And that the link between our skin and our psychological, social and wider well-being is complicated. We don't fully understand it all, but um, they are intricately interconnected. And if, if, if I had to say one thing, especially for those of you who kind of work in the industry, we all have a role to play in challenging stigma. We all have a role to play in challenging perceptions of what normal skin is. So thanks so much for everyone for joining and look forward to your questions.